The second session is uh, moving on to case studies. And in these case studies, we're going to be looking at uh, population, uh, sorry, uh, uh, education policies. One check one. I'm always looking at population policy. My name's Terry Hall. I'm at the uh, Australian uh, Demographic and Social Research Institute here at the ANU. Uh, and have been coming to the Indonesia updates for uh, since the beginning. Uh, and I must say, this is really an outstanding uh, program that we've had the last two days. It's really exciting, partially because the whole topic of education is so exciting, I think, for all of us uh, who work in the uh, areas of social development, social change. Uh, education is uh, a key element. Um, we have two papers uh, to uh, be presented over the next hour. Uh, we are going to try to uh, finish on time so that you can get your coffee break because we don't want to steal any time from the uh, session this afternoon uh, or this at, at noon time of the panel discussion, which will give you a lot of uh, time to bring up the questions that you may not have had answered in the last two days. Our speakers today uh, will be uh, talking with, uh, will be talking about their experiences, and I'd like to introduce uh, Nina Sapti Triaswati from University of Indonesia, who is going to give you a presentation on does the Indonesian government system promote quality education? I think you've had some hints in the last day already, but. Nina is bringing an institutional analytical approach that may give you some different answers. Ibu Nina. Okay, thank you, Padari. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, the title that I put here, uh, basically answering the other side of the box that's been explained by uh, Anis just minutes before. Uh, where are we now? Trapped in the box, and this is the box that I would like to share with you. Uh, we are discussing uh, the role of government, especially the institutions actually built for the government system work, and the organization for quality education, if it is actually our education target, and supporting system for that to work. And this is the ideas. Uh, basically, the ideas is institutions for us economists. It's the set of rules and regulations, both formal and informal. And we know that this is resulting in structure that we have, and we have the conduct, the implementation, and of course the performance that we hope we will reach quality education. And this is the least I will not. Uh, tell you by one, one by one, it takes me another day actually to explain exactly what is it in the list. <laughs> Role of government in education, but at least this is a big picture of the budget first. Uh, the amount of money we spend at the central government for education in 2011 is 90 trillion, around 90 trillion, transferred to the region 157 trillion, education development fund uh, 1 trillion, it's kind of trust fund. Total national education allocated by the government is 246. So to the APBN, the budget is uh, 1,229 trillion. GDP is that amount, 7,427 trillion. So we can say, okay, we actually uh, align with our uh, constitutions. We said that 20% of the budget for education function allocated from our budget. And to the GDP, very small amount, 3.3 percent. But this is, remember, only government budget. So that's why when Anis told us just now, ah, there are share from companies. It's not included in the numbers here because the amount here actually reflected government budget only. And we know that actually private sector in our GDP is around one fifth, uh, more than one fifth. Yeah? Uh, the rest of the GDP. So government only around uh, 1,200. So the rest is household and private sector. 
from you know 20% only uh, MBBM to the GDP. Now the list of regulations that make us the box, a very tight box, starting with contribution, of course the direction on the, uh, why we should produce the high quality education, hopefully, and then the laws itself that make us rules and regulation. If we use government budget, the one that we just explained, we should follow the state law, uh, the state finance law. And then we should follow also national education system, their national treasury allocated for investigation, management, accountability, then also the law for regional government, we should uh, trace that allocation through the uh, equalization grant, which is the financing balance yeah, between central regional government. So all this uh, uh, national planning law and until the regulation itself yeah, down there. So that the set of formal rules and regulations supporting for the quality education, basically we want to reach that. And this is in our constitution. And we also want to uh, have the details on that. Based on our national education system, we should produce the uh, quality education. And the organization for the quality education, actually, of course, the president himself, because this is uh, across ministries, uh, explained before, like Ministry of Radio Religious Affairs, yeah, and also Ministry of Education and Culture, mainly, and then MOHA is uh, for higher, uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Planning, BPK is national audit system yeah, for controlling the amount of budget. And at the local level, which is the power distributed to them directly, so that's the uh, party, what about the governor? Yeah, the main player is actually Bupati and Walbota, but then education office, Babada Sekda, Wawasda, that's the whole system at the local level. The main function itself, actually, the guidance given by the education and culture, showing that we have a revised strategic plan after the Jungabi that was established in uh, 2010. So that's the basis for decision-making progress that we want, both as national uh, and the local, central and local. Ministry of Home Affairs provides rules and regulations for government accountability. So the share, the amount that allocated for education function at the regions actually should be transparently accountable to the public and they should give report, like if we call it. And local district government announces the operational rules and regulations, yeah, how actually uh, at the local level, uh, they, uh, uh, let's say the recruitment down there, yeah, the final say is at the district. Uh, government level, as uh, what explained yesterday. And about the finance, uh, actually we have the whole picture of financial reform currently going on in Indonesia, including the process of accountable uh, report, yeah? how to prepare from the idea itself, actually performance planning, budgeting and auditing. So the whole set actually hopefully we get from the Minister of Finance is the whole picture that we are accountable for every cent or every rupiah we spend on uh, from the government budget or taxpayer money. And national planning actually a uh, little control now, not as before, not uh, at the time of the baru, now actually only coordination of planning, yeah, mainly, not, not much say on the budget any longer. Now this is the box that we, after we have this list of laws and regulation, the planning and budgeting actually coming from these two law, law of uh, uh, one negara. Yeah, so these two interact, so start from planning until uh, uh, final uh, budget. And this is at two level. We have local and we have central. Yeah. And that's, that's rather <laughs> complex because after that we should accountable for the funding, right? After planning, budgeting, so we said, uh, at there, here, here actually the system uh, uh, accountability report. So that's why I understand uh, why Pak said no, no government budget. <laughs> because so much, yeah, you should be responsible, start from the planning, you should put it a year, sometimes two years before your plan, yeah. So that you put there and then uh, the process until they approve is another year. And then after that, you should be accountable for any rupiahs. Yeah. So no wonder that around 50% of uh, the party, what you call the governor, no in jail, you know, 
facing the problem with KPK. Uh, why? Because this is the process they should understand very well for every sense. They should be accountable here. At the end, they put the performance indicators. What is the performance indicators? As I mentioned at the beginning, there is a strategic plan by the government. I should check uh, and I have uh, should, can show you the list of certificates uh, yeah, for education sector, primary, secondary, others uh, about entities for higher education. So you have the main uh, uh, performance indicators. But then the question is whether actually it related to the budget. Not necessarily so. Yeah, so it's sometimes the indicators there, sometimes the budget here, but the responsibility is at the end when the, uh, here, you check the uh, uh, audit BPK, BPK down there, the corner, asking you, or maybe before BPK is Pak Kuntoro first, the UKP 4 under the President Wing, actually asking how much do you spend? Is it 100% or 90%? If it is not 100%, you are not reached the target for spending, not yet performance, yeah? just spending you. So this is a set, oh, that, that's financial accountability. Basically, is what we ask at the beginning, not yet at the performance for the program, yeah. I mean, uh, BPK currently mainly audit for the financial part, yeah. So actually, every year at the end of the fiscal year, the government should check whether it is 100%. If it is only 90%, you are not, not well dispersed the money, yeah. So the disbursement level is the main important thing. And we said this is actually part of the weakness of our story. And especially if you have this big picture about monitoring and reporting, again, why I truly understand why uh, better not using government money for a very out of the box thinking model of education, because they should follow at yeah, the level, if the spending there at Bupati, you should do this, and governor spending from governor there, uh, and there uh, at the central. So you have Dana Pembantuan, assistance fund, you have type of test concentration fund, and at the direct there, the government have also central fund. Yeah, so that's the type of uh, reporting, monitoring that should be uh, completed. Yeah. I can explain one by one, but then it's too much time for that. The basic idea is, it's too complicated, right? I mean, and then make a big question, what do we face actually in our market institution, another institution? We have this demand from households, actually want to have increasing trend of population, and we have uh, the middle class actually increasing as uh, uh, projected by others organization also by the world bank and i put like mckenzie report here because that's consumer side uh, projection increases about 45 million currently in about 2010 2010 to more than three times later on 2030 including for education sector so actually that's very important figures why the private sector is more important yeah, in this case, including for education sector. And the current employment data shows that more than half of Indonesian workers still at the primary or less. Now there's potential demand for quality education, for access first and then quality. And the supply, as we have the data before, government versus private, actually for primary and secondary schooling, government is the main player. We have the data, the main provider for schooling, yeah. Uh, uh, on the average, yeah, but especially for religious affairs, private education is more, right? But for overall primary secondary education, government, uh, state, uh, public, public primary school or public secondary school. While private actually sector is the main provider for tertiary education. Yeah. One third is public, about two third private. Uh, in terms not numbers, yeah, but in terms of. Uh, Cities, yeah, students. And the access for schooling, of course, the higher the level of education, the lower school participation rate, and especially the data, as we see mass data, uh, shows that uh, only small proportion of the poorest family could enter the higher education. So that very small regions, but that picture. So we have the picture here, look, uh, 55 million SB ke bawah, meaning primary school or less. So that picture. Okay. I pushed on Yeah, here, yeah, 2012. 
So it shows that we still have stock uh, because at the end of the day, we hope this is the main contribution for our uh, uh, what's called welfare in the society. So we hope one day it shift, yeah, not as the Kabbalah, yeah, after universal or a compulsory education that we have now. We hope in 2012 actually the SD uh, less, yeah, so actually SMP is become the main one. But it's not. Yeah, current is the 55, 20 for uh, SMP, SMA is the uh, senior high school, and SMK is the one. So that's a picture. We have 112 yeah, for the total uh, pekerja. So this is pekerja. Yeah, uh, 15 years for workers. And then the variation of uh, cohort, yeah, the one that already enrolled at school. We can check the average picture here. And of course, Papua, but then there, is still among the lowest, 46%. <coughs> and uh, Dikai Jakarta, Sumatra is around 70%, so that's the best in the average for the year of schooling, yeah, 7 to 24. But you can check uh, the higher level education, the less, yeah? So let's say for Papua here, 15, but the others is uh, uh, higher. And Jakarta is, Dikai Jakarta as usual is uh, higher. So the uh, Dikai is around 16, but Oh, Lady Yogyakarta is the highest one for higher education because that's small city and the percentage is higher. Now the point is, this is the variation that we have among regions, showing yes, we have problem not only in the average data, but also among regions there is disparity. So the issues of challenges is when we are discussing, is it the access of quality? That's a big picture first, but we know that first we should provide the access, and then we hope with the access we have the step further for measuring the quality improvement using this box, yeah? using this uh, uh, bureaucratic box, uh, funding from government. Also Indonesia uh, has this framework, actually we still need many things to improve this box to work so that it could reach the target that we hope. No. This is the issues. First, the consistent design. Yeah, we still have list of operational rules and regulation. For example, like recruitment. Yeah, and the effective organization structure. Yeah, how to manage the quality. So that the overall picture, we can check the organization structure. Actually, the implementation is at the lower level, while actually the central the main education policy at the minister level. So we need kind of communication among the two, which is. Uh, easily if you use technological improvement now, ICT, but unfortunately not all regions could be well connected there, yeah, but yes, there is uh, some improvement in that area. So when you listen to the example just before, the central government minister ministry in the regional affairs do not know that one of the uh, schools is that bad. So we understand the information system does not work well, so that they don't, they cannot have the uh, the right, uh, what you call it, data to show this is actually the actual problem. So the main education policy there at the central level. Monitoring evaluation need to be supported, actually complicated, but need to be supported yeah, by integrated information system. Ministry of Home Affairs, Finance, National Planning actually has this long requirement, accountability report they call it. Yeah, how to be accountable for the finance, for Minister of Home Affairs, how to become accountable as the regional governor, regional bupati, or mayor, yeah. So that's actually all the, the, the list that we need. And the National Supreme Audit, if they have troubles, usually then they go further for investigation or investigative audit. And the question for consensus on defining quality education, still a bit problem when we check the target yeah, prepared by the central government, it is not clearly defined kind of quality education. Is it just input indicators or we hope for better one, output indicators? So for example, like the limited input uh, indicators, so most of the list that we check in the uh, uh, strategic plan, 
is actually mostly a supply side. So let's say the buildings, uh, number of schools at international standards should be there. So it's mostly like supply side input. Yeah. Limited indicators on the output about the quality of graduates. How about the outcomes, employment, productivity, yeah, the impact of that. And in terms of service, the demand, how about the students itself, yeah. The list numbers is actually they have the APK, uh, gross enrollment rate. So also the Ministry of Education revised the strategic plan to accommodate this performance management model that been explained by the Ministry of Finance and uh, Ministry of Planning, for example, to have this big picture of public financial management reform, but there is no direct control actually central to the local, so the implementation agency sector uh, local. Indicators also still input, and a few demand side indicators like percentage of population age is one of it, more than 15 years that it is that's the only one I can find in the uh, 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 Director General of Power, for example, but others actually just uh, Africa and gross. Yeah, so not much on the quality. Very limited incentive system at school level for quality teaching on learning. So if yesterday we listened that, oh, there is no wonder, yeah, whatever we are doing in the classroom, there is no effect, I mean, will not affect anything at the end. Yeah, because that's not reported. I mean, the report needed is only number of teachers there, whether it is matched or not. So how about the incentive system? Yes, it works for the higher education better than the lower. So at tertiary level, some university, uh, for example like my university, University of Indonesia, they play a little bit there yeah, for giving the performance indicator at the lowest level, but not much. Yeah, teacher remuneration usually just given the amount of money uh, based on the average standard, yeah, but not it doesn't reflect anything about the the quality of teaching in the classroom. Yeah. So the remuneration basically does not uh, represent the teacher performance in the classroom for the quality of the process. So the consensus, yes, we just see uh, many follow functions that the idea. So exactly where the incentive schools that they prepare the report for that uh, pro I mean for that uh, purpose. So we actually provide general accountability report for the uh, school system of the government, including education sector, but it doesn't provide details. Yeah, the details should come from technical ministries. And Ministry Finance, National Supreme Audit, this is the one who design. And at the end, we are thinking that BPK should then conduct performance audit regularly if the performance indicator could be uh, uh, built yeah, at the beginning, the consensus whether the demand side or the student side or teaching and learning is important, should be there in the performance audit. But not yet, currently it's not there. Yeah, so the issue of Ministry of Planning also different mechanism than before. So also just actually what happens now, they're just having the most land bangunas, I call Musyawarah Perencanaan Nasional, every, once every year, but then uh, it seems like there is not much communication. It is already well prepared before, yeah? so it's kind of ceremonial, we call it. So at last, then we are thinking, okay, maybe better if they are doing regular data monitoring yeah, for Ministry of National Planning, which they have before, is not only data, but also budget there yeah, in the time of Suharto era, but not now. So uh, then this is becoming one possibility. And the supporting system, if the government really want the quality education work, is about incentive, yeah. Currently is very weak, and we know that it's not easy to hire and fire yeah, if you find the uh, teachers based on civil servant, servant law, we cannot fire teacher easily. Private sector could have that better system in their school level or in their uh, uh, university level. Civil society, as mentioned by Anis before, is so easy because they recruit one year, if they are performed, then they are appreciated. If not, you not even recruited, you know, at the beginning. So it's very loose, yeah, very uh, good. Now, this is the need for uh, limited integration system. We can build it. So this is the policy recommendation. So actually, basically, if we want the role of government is correct. So what we hope is strengthening the role of government in terms of correcting, uh, because what they said is since education is a right for the people now. 
So strengthening in terms of look at the structure, is it the right structure and whether it is accountability is there. Yeah, so the conduct actually. What happens now, it is boxes. Yeah? So Ministry of Finance have their funding report, Ministry of Home Affairs, they have accountability report. Another one is if you want to have planning, you propose that to Ministry of Planning. So that will have it, our current structure. Yeah? Another country make a merger between finance and Mabnas type of debt, like Korea, for example. On that, actually, uh, this is improved effectiveness. Yeah? What we call is the if we have uh, like online system banking, it is easy to check every data and we find the holes there. But it is not there yet. Indonesia still improved at the Ministry of Finance level and also National Supreme Audit. It doesn't have the uh, right data to really correct the performance. And also Ministry of Education and Culture currently very weak for, uh, reporting, data reporting. Yeah. So need to be built, built in contact. And performance, of course, the consensus about in indicators, the monitoring and evaluation, what kind of monitoring we need yeah, to strengthen the accountability, but not more reporting, yeah, less reporting, simplified <coughs> procedures. So the role of private institution is about the model itself of public-private, which is uh, now we have already like uh, an investment model, uh, private also have uh, CSR, the corporate social responsibility funding directly, building the schools, yeah, and others. And the conduct actually we have the transparent process what we don't have now. And then the performance, we hope that the published report actually there in the everywhere so that easily for us to, uh, for everybody to know that what uh, example we have uh, Indonesia Manager has one and Citibank maybe have another one for CSR and the other uh, uh, Pertamina also supporting many. But Many of them usually not publish report regularly, so we don't know exactly what happens in the private as well society. Government have limited information on that, and that's time the role of government should be uh, further improved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right on time. This is what discipline brings to our paper. And uh, we do see the complexity of this reporting system, which is just amazing. If you think that it's hard to teach uh, little kids and uh, people in school, imagine filling in all these forms in your spare time. And it's just amazing. I won't say anything about the ANU. <laughs> Our next paper is going to bring us uh, an international perspective on internationalizing education. And uh, uh, we welcome uh, Kong Hin Hong from uh, Malaysia uh, Health University uh, to share his experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody is talking about Indonesia and perhaps more interested in Indonesia than Malaysia. <laughs> but hopefully the organizers thought that some comparisons can be made uh, between the higher education sector in Indonesia and Malaysia. And I think Malaysia had a very interesting 
experience. And I was quite fortunate to be part of this transformation and internationalization of higher education in Malaysia. Because we changed from a government-based uh, university system to have a myriad of private institutions offering a variety of degrees. We changed from an elitist system to a system whereby most people can have access to higher education provided they have some money to pay. We change from a Malaysian-based system into an international, a more open system and with a very heavy infusion of foreign programs on foreign universities and the government hopes to actually transform Malaysia into an education hub. Okay? Now, perhaps Malaysia invented twinning having an arrangement between a local educational institution and a foreign partner. Okay? Twinning started because of a variety of reasons and it is contextual, I must say. There were insufficient places at the public institutions, the government universities. There was a rising expectation among the population and demand for higher education was on the increase and perhaps very important is the ethnic or affirmative factor, affirmative action factor. Well, basically I named it affirmative action because uh, I was in the US when uh, the policy was implemented in Malaysia, that is to give access to uh, disadvantaged groups to have access to higher education and other economic opportunities. Okay. In Malaysia, it is more well known as a new economic policy. Okay. And opposition parties in Malaysia used to say it is a discriminatory policy against other ethnic groups. <laughs> so they all mean the same thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, Malaysia started twinning partners with some established foreign universities and I must say and I must point out that most of the arrangements were with lesser known universities in either Australia or in the United Kingdom. In my particular experience, Health Institute started with an institution which you may never have heard of the Dali Dance Institute of Advanced Education in Queensland. It is now the University of Southern Queensland. Okay, and there are of course some benefits to these universities uh, for training with almost unknown institutions in Malaysia called Health. Okay, now the interesting thing about this training arrangement is that actually these institutions had distance learning programs. So we were treated like a distance learning center. So they sent their distance learning materials to us and we used their materials to teach and then prepared the exams for the Australian institution concert or the UK institution concert. Another advantage which we had perhaps was the English medium. We use English medium in the private sector and uh, so that is uh, made it more comfortable for foreign institutions who are, which also uses the English language for their teaching and for their medium of instruction. Okay? Now, training, there are a variety of training arrangements depending on different institutions. Okay, most of the time the Malaysians did the teaching, but the foreign institution actually had academic control over those programs in terms of the examination questions as well as the marking of the examinations. Okay, and the Malaysians were not allowed to complete their degree in Malaysia. They had to do a part of the degree in Malaysia and then transfer to those training partners abroad. That was a rule in Malaysian, by the Malaysian government. 
they were not allowed, we were not allowed to offer the whole degree in Malaysia. So the students had to do part of their degree in Malaysia and then part of their degree abroad. And it was done on a revenue sharing basis between the two institutions. Okay? And different arrangements had different uh, sharing arrangements. Now, these are very common terminology which you may not heard of 1 plus 2. 1 plus 2 meant that the students did one year in Malaysia and then they had to do two years abroad. Okay? And this was how a lot of the private institutions started. Okay? Very entrepreneurial, very pioneering. We were very small operations operating out of shop blocks, basically. Okay? That was in the 1980s, 25, 26 years ago. In the 1990s, it became 2 plus 1. 2 plus 1 meant that the student could complete 2 years in Malaysia and still had to go abroad for 1 year. Okay? And we moved into larger premises because by that time, many large companies had seen the potential in private education as a service and they actually bought over many of the private colleges. So with the infusion of capital, better facilities, we were able to employ better staff and so we were able to grow much quicker than before. The third one, the 3 plus 0, was a change in policy by the government and basically because of the financial crisis in 1998, the government realized that many students were stranded in Malaysia. They could not afford to go abroad. The stock market crashed, the money was devalued. So the government allowed all three years of the degree programs to be completed in Malaysia. So it became known as 3 plus 0. By that time, the foreign programs were quite well established in Malaysia. There was also a, a significant change in the types of programs that were being offered. Previously, most of the colleges offered social science programs because the investments were relatively low. If you teach a business course, you don't need much equipment. If you are teaching engineering, it's a different story. So when the big companies took over the smaller colleges, they were able to put in money and many colleges begin to offer programs and degrees in uh, engineering, even medicine. Okay. Now of course there were plenty of benefits in the twinning arrangements. Okay. Firstly, it provided access to higher education, which is a very important factor actually because the government was able to diffuse a very important political debate that was going on. Okay? The government did not want to open up the universities to uh, complete open competition because of affirmative action. And therefore, by allowing the Chinese and the Indians to have access to higher education, the government actually diffused a very important political uh, contention in Malaysia. Very important is cost savings. If you do a program in Malaysia, you could save as much as 80,000 ringgit in the program. Basically, what was happening was that uh, if a student were to do a come to Australia, for example, and if they had to pay 10,000 in Australian dollars, they would have to pay maybe 8,000 ringgit which is a fraction of the cost. Plus, they would be able to save on the cost of living. Okay? The twinning became successful because of English as a medium of instruction. And it allows the country to have international programs. The country saved a lot in terms of foreign exchange. Okay? And it transformed many of the private colleges. And I think those universities that had training partners in Malaysia benefited substantially too because they were able to have a share of the revenue. Okay. 
These are some of the important, I would say, significant changes in policies uh, over the last two decades. The 3 plus 0 was a very significant change because it allowed the degree to be completed entirely in Malaysia. That meant that not only students did not have to go abroad, many students opted for private sector education because it meant that the cost would have been much lower than if they had to go abroad. Okay? And we were also able to attract foreign students into Malaysia. I will talk a little bit more about that later. Okay? The other significant change in policy is to allow branch campuses to be established in Malaysia. Uh, in the case of Australia, there are three now, uh, Monash, uh, Swinburne, mm, that's the third one. Curtin, Curtin yes. And there are two other uh, UK branch campuses. One American just started, uh, John Hopkins, and uh, Mani Powell just started uh, also from India. Okay? So the branch campuses are quite important because it allows further diversification of the educational programs that are being offered in Malaysia. The third point, college upgrade. We began, a lot of colleges, private colleges began by offering foreign degrees and we were not allowed to offer our own degrees. By upgrading colleges into university colleges, the government allowed private colleges to confer their own degrees. And this is what the government had done systematically over the past five years. Of course, going through what they considered stringent tests and stringent uh, regulations. Okay? You have to pass uh, the uh, requirements of the Malaysia's Accreditation Agency as well as the Ministry of Higher Education. Okay. Fourthly, dual or joint degrees. Dual degrees is something quite new in Malaysia, something which the government did not encourage because basically Malaysian institutions would confer, let's say, a Bachelor of Business and get the program moderated throughout the three years by a foreign partner, which would also confer a Bachelor of Business degrees because the contents match the foreign partner's uh, contents and the quality is quite similar and they're happy with that and so the arrangement is while the Malaysian campus university awards a degree, the foreign university will also award a, joint de uh, a dual degree, their own degree. So you have two separate degrees. Not something which is encouraged by the government but something which they cannot do much about because it is a degree conferred by a foreign university. Joint degree is quite rare. Joint degree, that means both universities issue one degree. And I'm very proud to say Help University has the first joint degree, undergraduate joint degree in Malaysia with Flinders University in South Australia, a Bachelor of Psychological Science. Okay, it is first and still the only one uh, because a lot of most foreign universities are quite apprehensive when it comes to offer a joint degree. Number five is foreign ownership. Again, this is a significant change because the government is going to allow or has allowed now 100% foreign ownership in an educational institution. This is not the branch campus, but a company can set up a campus and have 100% ownership. And this is what the Lorette Group from USA has done. They have bought over an uh, existing uh, college, Inti College or Inti University, and uh, they have now a majority share and they expect to have 100% control in the two or three years' time. Okay? Now, is there a Malaysian brand? Yes and no. I mean, we are quite a uh, potpourri in many ways. We have 20 public universities which are funded by the government. We have 36 private universities and university colleges. Okay? 
We have 288 colleges offering a variety of diplomas okay, and certificates. There are 19 colleges offering 89 Australian degrees in Malaysia and there are 30 colleges offering 88 British degrees in Malaysia. Two colleges offer American degrees. So we do have a wide choice if you can say that that's our Malaysian brand. Okay? We have a wide choice. You can get a bachelor's degree right up to a doctoral degree. Okay? I think the Malaysian environment is very good for foreign students and this is what the Malaysian government is trying to do. We use English medium so that uh, as far as the private colleges are concerned, uh, so that uh, people are quite familiar, who are quite familiar with the language can easily join the institutions. If, they, if we use Bahasa Malaysia as the public universities do, then that might become a little bit more of a problem. Okay? We have a very multilingual environment for foreign students. Cost of living is very low. We do have a very congenial environment. Those of you who have traveled to Kuala Lumpur or Malaysia, and it was quite easy for, for foreign students to get visas. And especially after September 11, when students from the Middle East found it very difficult to get visas to study in USA or United Kingdom, uh, there was a significant improvement in the numbers who came to Malaysia. Okay. I'm trying to give you in this uh, table a comparison between the public and the private enrollments over the past 10 years. And as you can see in 2012, those studying in the private institutions, the numbers are as large as those studying in the public institutions. And this is a comparison of uh, foreign students in the private and the public sector. Uh, as I said earlier, most of the foreign students are in the uh, private sector because of the medium of instruction, because they could get into the programs of their choice. Okay, because uh, the public universities have quotas for all their programs. And also because the public universities impose a quota on the number of foreign students, because public universities are 100% paid for by the government, and the students in public universities pay very, very low fees. So if, foreign, if they meet a lot of foreign students, it would mean that they are actually subsidizing or paying for the foreign students. So the public universities, therefore, have a different target. They try to attract masters and PhD students to be part of the research team and to complement their research and their teaching. Okay? So they see internationalization in that direction as opposed to the private institutions. Uh, this is a comparison of the cost of living in Malaysia as with other countries. So you can see that it is again significantly lower uh, compared to USA, Australia, or the United Kingdom. Okay. Now the regulatory environment in Malaysia has changed significantly. Uh, I will read one through it. The Ministry of Education has revamped completely the private, those sections or those divisions and the people handling private higher education. In fact, a whole Ministry of Higher Education was separated from the old Ministry of Education to take care of uh, both the public and the private higher education. And the third very important regulatory body is the Lembaga Accreditasi Negara, LAN, and later which was changed into the Malaysian Qualifications Agency. This agency is responsible for monitoring both the public and the private sector in terms of their quality. Okay? No program can be offered without approval from the 
Malaysian Qualification Agency, which will later, after the program is launched, come to accredit the program uh, and to see that it is, everything is in order before accreditation status can be granted to each program. So all our programs, there's a lot of documentation. Uh, each program has to be given, uh, details of all programs have to be submitted to the qualifications agency for them to, and they'll send in a team of accredited, accreditors. Okay, these are some of the very important legislation uh, involving both uh, the public and the private education sector. Okay. There is a co policy contradiction in terms of the government. The government has opened up drastically, I would say, in terms of uh, the private sector in higher education. Up to 19, 1973, in fact, the government passed the amendments to the University and University Colleges Act, explicitly stating that no institution of higher education can be established to confer degrees without the approval of the government. But now the government has decided that they want to open up the uh, higher education sector to the private sector. Okay? And at the same time, the government has also put in place a lot of controls and regulations to ensure that there is no hanky-panky going on in the uh, private higher education sector. Now, there are various quality issues which <coughs> I would like to discuss because I remember when I left the university for the Health Institute then, my colleagues almost thought it was a joke. How can you leave University of Malaya for a private tutorial college which hardly had any staff? So they always had the idea that uh, uh, private institutions would have a much lower quality. Okay? And, but thankfully, we were able to change that perception within a very short span of time, partly because of the government's policy. In Malaysia, all civil servants, including university staff, had to retire at age 55. And we were able to attract a lot of our ex-colleagues uh, who retired at 55 into our uh, private in sector institutions. Okay. And I think we have very good teaching quality because we have a very demanding clientele. For 16 years when I was at the University of Malaya, nobody ever complained, no parent ever came to see me. But now, because they are paying, as soon as there's some problems, lecturers turning up late, lecturers closing class early, lecturers cancelling classes, parents will phone out and say, what's the problem? Why, why, why is so and so cancelling classes? So there's a very demanding clientele because they feel that if they are paying so much money, they have a right to question what is going on. Okay. Well, time's up. But uh, these are some of the quality issues which I would like to briefly mention. We are subjected to a whole host of quality assurance procedures and agencies. No? our partner universities, the external examiners of our partner universities, okay? the quality assurance agencies, our own uh, a professional association, and international bank benchmarking. Uh, thankfully, because we ran international foreign programs, we were able to benchmark with those programs right from the beginning. Okay? I would say that the quality issue is one not between private or public, but between elite and mass education. Okay? We have a very large diversity of students, and hence we have to be more mindful of what's going on in the class. Okay, uh, I think Malaysian private higher education is a success story. I just want to mention that we are now ranked number 11 in terms of students' numbers though it is only 2% of the world international market. Still far behind Australia, but we'll catch up one day. Thank you. Very much. <laughs>
The time is up, but we will treat that as the yes, answer to the first question. <laughs> uh, we now have uh, a few minutes for questions, uh, and we would like to keep them to questions rather than extended comments, and we would like it to keep it to one or two questions, I would say two, because it's obvious that people start saying, well, my 16th question is, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I saw Hal Hill's hand first up there, then second, uh, third, and then we'll come over to this side. Uh, I'd like to address a question to Professor Khan. I enjoyed your talk very much. I've argued in, in another context that Malaysia is probably the most successful uh, East Asian example of, of private higher education, and I think your talk confirms that. A lot of lessons for Indonesia, uh, a couple in particular which occurred to me, one is the, the visa issue, the fact that Indian, uh, Malaysia is very open to, to the movement of staff and students. Uh, the ownership issue you mentioned, I think, is very relevant. Uh, a, a, a question is, um, you've, had a, you've sort of got a dual structure, as you alluded to in Malaysian higher education, where you've got a fairly well-funded state system, but it's pretty heavily regulated, as we know, and somewhat politicised. And now you've got this dynamic new private sector. Is the private sector shaking up the public sector? That is the question. I mean, uh, quite a few of my Malaysian friends have transferred from the public university to the private, and so that perhaps creates a bit of competition for the private sector, the public, to keep them on their toes. And related point, the final question, uh, the NQA, can you tell us a bit about the impact its effectiveness? Because that is quite important in establishing the Malaysian brand name. Is it an effective? credible organisation. It's fair to say all countries struggle with accreditation. Australia does and Indonesia obviously does. Thank you. We'll take the three uh, questions together and then uh, get responses. Uh, Rami Rohanian from USA Indonesia. Uh, if I understand Ibu Nina's uh, presentation correctly, it looks like uh, the quality it remains the problem. The quantity is yes, because the government keeps allocating more and more budget over the years. Uh, Jakarta Post about a month ago reported that mis uh, financial mis mismanagement at public universities become rampant and it's not, it, it doesn't exclude a tier one university such as UE and UGM. So uh, that's really a challenge uh, if yesterday uh, people talked about uh, moving towards world-class universities. How can we expect universities to become world-class when the rectors and the leaders of the university are still grappling with the financial reporting requirements that are being authorized by different uh, agencies? So the question to uh, Chi Kong uh, from Malaysia, is there a similar problem in Malaysia that uh, rectors have to grapple with so many uh, financial reporting requirements? such uh, we found in Indonesia. And is there a kind of school of rectors? Because no rectors in Indonesia have ever been trained to be become rectors. Thanks. Uh, two very quick questions. One is, uh, you may have put up the slide that went over too fast. Is the twinning model becoming the dominant private higher education model in, in Malaysia, number one? And have any twinning arrangements broken down? Okay, um, Ibunina, would you like to respond Yes, the message actually for the presentation is we have too many players for education sector. And education is not alone, yeah. other sectors also like that. So Ministry of Finance actually the one who decided the allocation, of course, uh, uh, asking the accountability of allocation itself. Yeah. But then the problem is what what is the accountability? For them is financial disbursement, not much on quality like what they have. I mean like what Minister of Education and Culture has in the uh, what you call it strategic plan. And even when we check the strategic plan, it's difficult for whoever really measuring that. Yeah, so actually the question is, if you prepare a strategic plan, is it really effective in terms of accountability? Because if it is there and not using that for measuring anything, because when we check the report, at the end it's just financial disbursement, and that's the message. So that's why uh, first is about accountability, and the second is about 
too many players, so many reporting, yes. And it's not only higher education, it's also a primary and secondary yeah, in, in some ways. So that's why not much, I can imagine the administrator busy with uh, administrative works. Yeah. So how to simplify actually the procedures that become the, the uh, homework yeah, for that. I think that's the answer. And that's why then at the end of the day, some, some administrators trapped with this KPK, we call it Commission for uh, Corruption. Yeah. They should know exactly the procedures uh, so that they do not spend uh, money, uh, government funding through different channels or whatever. Yeah, so the procedures becoming very complicated. Yeah. So that's the idea. Uh, the KPK actually uh, has a lot of job to do. Yeah. And BPK was also audited, yeah. like our university, and BPK and KPK, are working together on that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't think they have, they have under the public university have had a shakedown, but I think they have realized that uh, we are maybe not their competitor yet, but they have to look over their shoulders now. Because we do get a share of very good students now opting out into the private sector. People with straight A's opt out of the public education to go private. So they don't have a monopoly of good students. When we started 26 years ago, uh, perhaps that was the case because people who couldn't get access to higher education, they came to the private sector. This is no longer the case. Uh, NQA, I think um, they are quite stringent and most of the assessors actually come from the public universities. So they want to make sure that we don't fool around. And, uh, it was started as the National Accreditation Board and then further legislation gave it a new name and new functions and they are responsible also for the public sector now. Okay? Uh, financial problems of the rectors, I really don't know since I've never been a rector in the public sector. But I was head of department in a public university and I must say there were no problems. Twinning arrangements still very strong in Malaysia. Uh, broken down, uh, some have, uh, well not broken down, in some times, in my own experience, uh, it was rather fortunate because we outgrew our partners. Uh, we had a training program with a lower rank institution in UK for our law program. Uh, that was how we started and subsequently we were able to make arrangements with higher rank institutions and no students opted for the lower rank institutions and so that partnership broke, died a natural death in some ways. You know? um, we had, had another partnership with an Australian university that uh, in some ways broke down uh, because of uh, uh, not so much over financial arrangements uh, but over the demands of other partners. You see, this university had two partners. We were running one program, a business program, and the other partner was running the IT program. And the other institution wanted a business program too. And we said, well, we're not willing to do that. Either you open up completely, we'll be free to take other partners if you want to offer your program to other institutions. So in the end, uh, that partnership broke down, if you can consider it. But twinning is still a very strong uh, arrangement with uh, uh, private colleges that have not been upgraded. They have no choice but to continue with the twinning. On this side here, one, one in the middle. Yes, uh, can you uh, give the microphone? Yes, just put your hand up again, so people. Know. So one, two, and then three. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Thank you. My name is Hirshad from School of Sociology. Just one question to Mr. Koth. Uh, uh, I'm wondering, is there any uh, similar kind of policy like twining applied to uh, the lower level of education? And is there, how about the, the success story? Does it gain the same success story as twinning? That's all, thanks. Thank you, my name is Adi Budiarso from University of Canberra. Uh, my observation from your uh, great presentation, it was very insightful, uh, that the innovative ideas came in Indonesia education policy is quite low and I might suggest that the problem might be because of the regulation that already been you know put in place after the hectic probably the falling of the past regime, so the regime is put a lot of pressures for every single you know leaders in the bureaucracy to not commit bureau, uh, corruption, but then that created you know uh, another challenge to innovate. Uh, the I would like to ask whether. We need probably some kind of uh, the bureaucratization or kind of the innovative ideas in trying to prohibit, you know, pressure from the system or for the regulation that might, you know, hinder leaders to innovate. And so many people now tend to use the public, not, uh, you know, government budget rather. So this is kind of the, you know, problematic. Uh, as we know here in uh, Australia, we have uh, what we call it a Department of Finance and Deregulation. I don't think that we have in Indonesia. Probably the regulation department should be put in place in Indonesia. Just trying to, you know, uh, impose the deregulation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, one very quick question by Idris, and then we we'll have the responses and we need to break. Thank you for that interesting presentation. Um, I'm Andrew Suleiman from the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, I'd like to ask um, you about um, the, uh, your reaction uh, from, uh, announcement from the Malaysian government that it was um, rolling out 10,000, uh, uh, took 10,000 schools in Malaysia, very high capacity internet uh, 4G broadband facility. Um, to what extent is uh, uh, the university sector also, uh, uh, and the private sector in, uh, in Malaysia, investing in IT and e-learning? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, the bureaucratization is a good word for that. Actually, we try to simplify procedures, and the best thing to do is actually apply, applying the IT. Yeah, and that, that actually uh, set up in the public financial management reform in Indonesia, but it's very slow. So, to give you the pictures, actually, like South Korea made it seven years, and Indonesia is now about 15 years, right? 98 until now. So, the question is why and how? Yeah, why, of course, we know uh, uh, what's it interest groups uh, there to really work hard to implement the IT. Because if it is, then we can have kind of online banking system, for example, in the private sector. You can easily track the performance, easily track the financing and the result, etc. But it's not yet. But the other is, of course, the constraint of regulation is right itself, like the uh, decentralization. Yeah. So one is at the low level and the other at the uh, high level and the other at the lower level. So we can start, of course, uh, cutting rectives in the lower level, that's the easiest one. But the best thing is installing the IT. That's, I think, the idea uh, to put now. Thank you. I think in terms of the lower level education, the government is beginning to liberalize. Uh, they are allowing uh, the private sector to set up international schools, as well as private schools which would run on the Malaysian uh, education syllabus. 
this is this was a sector which was under very tight control. Malaysian, stu Malaysian students could not go to the international school unless their parents have been in the foreign service and they came back to Malaysia, then they are allowed to enter the international school. But uh, the government is changing that now and uh, allowing the private sector to set up more international schools which would be open to both Malaysian and international students as well as private schools which would run on the Malaysian government syllabus. So they are liberalizing the private sector, uh, the education sector. IT, uh, the Multimedia Development Corporation is responsible for promoting IT and uh, other related activities and um, institutions of higher education which meet some of their criteria would be allowed to have access to uh, tax rebates in terms of their purchase, purchases of IT equipment and computers as well as uh, they allow the private sector and also to compete for research funds. And one of the big things which they are trying to promote now is animation. So if anybody is interested in animation, there is plenty of money to do collaborative research. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're not going to talk about cartoonists this morning. Um, would you join me in thanking our speakers for a very interesting